Right, so the point is, this is a lightning talk session. Um, every speaker's got five minutes. We still need to somehow roll over the speakers and introduce them as well. well that, doesn't, that doesn't subtract from their five minutes. That is something we have to do in the 30 seconds in between. So one of us is going to be the usher, the other one's going to be the bouncer. I uh, don't know which direction it's going gonna, it's gonna to ro roll around. The, the trick with the time is that's the time. That is the official time. Even if you think it runs ra ra rather fast, then there's no complaining. That's our notion of five minutes. It has, it has worked in the past, except, and that's probably the introduction I should give, except for one time, which was me. I overran by, what was it, four minutes? So this is why I'm still doing this presenting job. Um, I'm sort of repenting for my sins. So if anybody else rolls over, they will be the next chair for the lightning sessions next year. <laughs> motivated? Not motivated at all? Excellent, excellent. Um, shall we? Stephen Winter, Heartbleed and Eep in five minutes. Oh no, this was this the clock. Is running. Sorry. Reset the clock. Go. Yes. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Stephen Winter from Restina Foundation in Luxembourg. And, uh, Not that fast. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about Heartbleed and what it means to the EAP protocol, and more specifically to Eduro. Now, first of all, I only have five minutes, so if you have never seen this logo here, you can take, go out and take yourself a coffee. I can't make an introduction on Heartbleed at all, but uh, only what it means to our protocol stack. Now, what many people know about Heartbleed is this. This is a protocol stack, which is pretty easy. You have the IP protocol, TCP on top, TLS on top of that. And uh, some clever people have found a way to compromise TLS uh, on this simple stack. In the first days when Heartbleed was out, people said, oh, this is all about web servers. And a couple of days later, a revelation kicked in and people said, oh, wait, there is also IMAP servers, SMTP servers, basically everybody who does TLS on this kind of stack. Now, when we folks from Edurum Operations heard that there is this heartbleed issue out, we were wondering, wait a second, we are also using TLS, but uh, we have a different mix of uh, technologies here, and it looks as frightening as this here. So um, we have uh, two different stacks and parts of the itinerary of a packet from source to destination. We have a stack which starts with the Ethernet framing, then EAP over LAN on top of it, then EAP itself, then an EAP method, and then there is TLS inside. <coughs> Sometime along the way, this whole stack gets torn down, and the uh, TLS gets re-encapsulated uh, in a normal IP packet. So IP, UDP, radius, EAP, an EAP method, and then comes TLS. Now, this looks uh, mighty complicated, uh, especially if you see UDP and TLS. No, this is not DTLS. This is traditional TLS running over the UDP protocol via some intermediate magic. So I'm not going to go into detail on that one. But my question, on the question we had in Ethereum operations was, so does this really work? So is TLS also vulnerable against Heartbleed? And if so, what can we do? So um, we didn't know. It was really very complicated. And uh, so we asked the author of a very famous uh, EAP testing tool, um, what do you think? Does this really work? Are we affected by Heartbleed or not in Eti-Rome? And uh, unfortunately for us, uh, within a couple of uh, two or three hours, the uh, author of the uh, tool said, oh yes, you are. I just wrote export code and uh, I can successfully attack service. Um, luckily for us, we realized that the extent uh, of data you can read in a Heartbleed attack is much smaller than 64K, uh, just because well, you have seen the enormous stacking of protocols on top of each other. Each has their own MTU, each has their own retransmission problems, and um, building a packet that is actually exporting heartbeat is uh, quite hard. But you can do it, you get a couple of Ks out of it, and um, so we realized, okay, Agerome is vulnerable to heartbeat, so what can we do, and what is the impact for us? Uh, impact was basically uh, two different things. Uh, first of all, when you have a uh, Agerome radio server, it usually sits somewhere in the network core with direct access to your user databases because you have to verify user credentials. Um, so this is not your typical web server which uh, sits in some kind of DMZ and uh, can just be attacked from the outside. So you think you're very safe because there is this narrow path into your network with just UEP port 1812, but here still some outside attacker can go right into this core, which is a bit uneasy. And the second thing is once you are in this packet core, um, P uh, the attacker can uh, read the memory of your server. You're usually authenticating uh, users, so you have usernames and passwords in memory, which means an attacker can just uh, get valid at your own credentials out of your server's memory uh, for free and pretty easy. You can also steal your uh, server certificate. This is the same as in every web server. 
And um, then he can basically mimic being your at your home server to your users, uh, even if he's not. So this is some quite serious impact. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, first of all, we asked very nicely f from the author if we could get the export code. Uh, actually, I got that and it was uh, told to uh, t treat it very secretly. Uh, but I could use it to test the Adrome infrastructure, test every single server that is out there. Uh, does it respond to Heartbleed? And if yes, uh, we notify people that they uh, should fix their servers. We started with a about 20% uh, infection rate of the servers. Uh, after a lot of nudging of all the people in involved, um, we came back to something that is below 2% in the end of April. And uh, we just have very few remaining servers right now. Uh, which can't be bothered, but uh, by and large, the Ethereum infrastructure is now safe, and we are now releasing the uh, code both to uh, CSERT teams and to the general public. Uh, the green light for public release is out now. <laughs> the bar has been raised. <laughs> That's how you do it. Alrighty, next speaker. Rook, here we go. NLNet Labs. Ah, look, he's prepared. Control, yeah, yeah. control L. All and the benchmark is there, so... Uh. Indeed. And go. Okay. Hello, my name is Han Browers. I'm part of the NLNet Labs team based in Amsterdam. And uh, today I would like to uh, uh, exchange some ideas and thoughts with you regarding the sustainability of open source software projects. Or, in another question, uh, um, how to increase the stability of critical infrastructure components of the global internet. <laughs> For those who are not quite familiar with you, uh, when it comes to NL Labs, we are a foundation established in 1999 with the basic mission to develop an alternative to ISC's BIND uh, DNS server software. At those days, uh, BIND was the only uh, DNS server available, and due to our vulnerability uh, um, uh, challenges, um, the establishment of the foundation decided that is time, it was about time to develop an alternative. Uh, we called that at those days genetic diversity. Um, and as a matter of fact, we've uh, developed an uh, alternative which uh, is probably known by you, at least part of you, uh, I guess, as NSD, a validating or, or uh, authoritative name server, uh, DNS compliant, etc. Uh, in the uh, 15 years uh, that has followed, uh, the uh, foundation expanded its research and development activities into new areas like DNSSEC, IPv6, and more recently <coughs> into the routing and routing security area, all driven by our vision that um, uh, we provide inter international, uh, um, sorry, that's quite a, a different, uh, to provide globally recognized innovations and expertise for those technologies that turn a network of internet into a, a network of networks into an open internet for all. So the logo at the upper right side of uh, my slides represent Open Net Labs BV, which is a recently established commercial company with a, vi with a mission to establish and develop long-term financial st sustainability to the um, uh, foundation. It's basically a tax-oriented decision, and let's say from taxes to money is quite a small step. So um, what we do is provide services that in the end should add to the sustainability of the foundations. Uh, as a matter of fact, the community is strongly uh, um, driven by volunteers uh, supporting our uh, efforts. And uh, in the long term, the commitment and the ideas um, uh, provided contributed to a large extent. However, there is also a risk in this open model. The landscape is rapidly changing, and I would like to mention some of the things that are happen, uh, happening uh, currently. One of the things is scalability challenge. Um, what I see is that our um, uh, movements uh, going on uh, which I call the edge movements, demanding an incredible amount of development uh, efforts in order to uh, make the current DNS system scalability for the uh, future. Another one is security. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, security issues, uh, cybercrime, 
affecting uh, privacy of uh, individual users, networks uh, as a whole, organizations, etc. Demand for speed when it comes to solving, patching, um, uh, and uh, keeping um, the internet safe. Next to that, crime in general, not more related to speed, but in general, do require also a massive uh, development impact. The deployment of DNSSEC, uh, we are providing uh, all kind of DNSSEC services, do <laughs> require uh, also a lot of, uh, um, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, impact uh, and uh, development uh, resources. Now, on the long term, we uh, need commitment when it comes to ownership and the organizational hosting of open source projects. And that needs money. I'm not asking for money today, don't worry. But what I would like to do is exchange some ideas uh, with you on what, uh, what we can do together. Um, and that is in a matter of cooperating in projects where we can provide uh, project uh, capacity to you. Um, that's also in a, um, a way of engage you in our projects. And next to that, in things like supporting uh, and SLIs. However, one last question. Just stop this, please. <laughs> Thanks. Ten seconds more. One last question. What we would like to do is uh, ex establish a basis together with you, starting uh, exchanging ideas on how to collaborate, for instance, in participating in Horizon 2020 projects, etc. Thanks. <laughs> I will be here around to ask questions and exchange ideas. We have next year's chair. <laughs> okay, we now have apparently Olav. Olav, Uninet, where are you? Come to the front. Olav is standing in for his colleague uh, Govinda. But, uh, really? Yep. You look very different from your photo. Yeah, the, the, the photo. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't at the speaker's reception last night? Or were you? No, I went. I came today. Okay, very good. Yeah. So it's not, it's not me being, being crazy. But, don't, but then the, the photo is only 15 years old, so I... Oh, right. Right. okay, well, uh, yeah. It's clear. It's clear. This one. Very good. Yeah, why not? Yeah, can I, I can try, I try to do that one. Yeah, why not? That's, yeah. that's yeah. very good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Kevin, they would have done a much better job. But I'll try. Uh, how do I get this to move on? So. Uh, uh, since I've only got five minutes, I'm going to start with the main point. So the first line is the main point. We've been uh, trying to do a data analysis project uh, investigation at UNET in a small innovation activity. And we wanted to see if uh, we could find a way to support uh, big data issues at our customers. But during that process, we discovered that we actually have big data problems internally, inside, on, in our systems. And we have set up a uh, log analysis system that covers most of our operational services, like FADE, which is the authentication uh, uh, system in UNIT, the Samuel based uh, thing uh, connecting to EduGain, uh, for EduROM, which you all use, <coughs> for SIP, which is a distributed uh, uh, SIP based uh, telephony services, for the systems itself, the, the syslogs. And actually, the, the platform on, in which itself is running, the, the platform as a service thing, which is in the, in the bottom here. And this happened very quickly. During the first week of this the trial, the FADE service became, a log service became useful. Actually, we had an incident that made it easy for us to uh, find out what the problem was. Because the common thing about all these services is that they are running on uh, a lot of uh, machines, uh, a lot of different systems uh, at different levels, and uh, stringing all this information together is, is a big uh, problem, really. But with this solution, we think we have uh, a much better way of scaling monitoring. <coughs> and we did this then with a couple of tools. The Logstash tool is an open source uh, Log parsers, which is quite easy to customize, and then we use that to structure the data, pick out the interesting information in the logs, and store it into Elasticsearch, which is a distributed search uh, system. In, 
uh, quite scalable. It's free text. And then you use the Kibana, uh, uh, let's say, um, web application for visualization of the data. And the whole thing is running on commodity PCs. It uses, uh, um, uh, has a substantial uh, amount of memory for because that's very good with data locality. We have SSDs to have faster responses to disks. disks and uh, uh, the system itself is, as I said, is running on a, a platform as a service thing. And uh, how will we do this then? Uh, uh, <coughs> well, uh, it's quite simple. You need the distributed storage. Uh, and the fine thing about uh, is the horizontal scaling, which makes it easy to add new systems. And, uh, and that's necessary because these systems do grow. These logs are quite huge and they grow over time. Um, and it's also essential then to have a data locality. We need to store the data uh, on the systems that they process the data because that's the only way we can get speed uh, of uh, data lookup because it's a large amount of data. And you also need support both for structured and unstructured data. Uh, unstructured data is free, uh, free text search and replication gives us dependability and, and sharding spreads data over multiple disk drives so that we get fast enough total uh, IO read time. Uh, the distributed processing is uh, also essential. Uh, of course, it, it, it's what we all talk about. But uh, we hope then to advance this into uh, looking more into algorithms for distributed uh, learning. Because what they're doing at the moment is actually aggregation and presentation and search. And uh, yeah, on the bottom here, there is the uh, uh, commodity hardware which you don't need to strengthen because the replication, which is inherent here, <coughs> allows us to make the systems dependable without buying expensive stuff. And uh, this is the situation at the moment. We are trying to work more on testing out the system. We have a basic uh, test of, uh, of the basic file system, like HFS, Ceph, and Cluster, which compares their properties. We are now looking to more structured data, now we scale, let's say, HBase and Cassandra, and we'll also go to Spark on the processing side. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Keep some beeping. Yeah, I know. Maybe, well, that was... To urge, on this, urge on the chairs or something. I think it was. That was an excellent idea. Get, get going. Does that close just one of them? Yeah, very good. That's not him. No, I think Where's he's... Scott? I think he needs Scott. Scott's right there. Scott, uh, uh, hey. That's him. How do, I do, how, how do you do full screen in this one? Slideshow. Slide? Is it like this thing? Uh, I don't like know. Magic. You've got this thing as well. Oh, okay. Is it doing something? Is it doing uh, something? Ready okay. for it? Crashing? Yeah. Crashing? Yeah. Working? Crashing? Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Scott Armitage, and I work for Loughborough University in the UK. However, I'm also a member of the National Edurome UK support team. And one of the things we've been working on in the UK is monitoring uh, Edurome service providers. And the way in which uh, we're doing this is um, we have some monitoring probes. And here is one of our monitoring probes. Um, they're based on the TP-Link MR3020. And on top of that, we run OpenWR2 Barrier Breaker and this is a specially compiled version where we've basically stripped out everything other than the packages we need for the probe to operate. And I've also had to recompile something so we can securely uh, store the credentials. Um, then on top of that, we run WPA supplicant. And this is what we use then to uh, connect to Edgerome and run certain tests. And again, for WPA supplicant, I've recompiled that with support for Hotspot 2.0. Um, so hopefully in the future we can do some HS2 stuff. The code itself on the probe is all written in Bash. So these are just Bash scripts that uh, run different tests, connect to Edgerome, and then report back. And there's also Bash scripts for updating uh, and things like that. Um, and all this is available on, on GitHub. Um, so in theory, you could take 
the, the scripts and run it on anything which can run WPA supplicant and a couple of other packages we use. So once you've plugged in a probe, uh, it obviously will connect to Edge Home and then start reporting data. And what we do there is the probe, all the probes talk back to a support server in the UK and they report back over HTTPS. And we opted for HTTPS um, because we thought that if you connect to Edge Home, the one thing that really should work is web. So uh, the probes report over HTTPS. We stayed away from things like syslog because we thought there may be some sites which are, are blocking syslog. Um, so we went for HTTPS. Uh, when we send the <coughs> test results back, uh, we send uh, a SHA check some, a SHA one check some with them, um, and we what we do is we take the probe data and a salt value and hash the two together, and each probe has a different salt value, and this is just to prevent people poisoning uh, our database with fake uh, probe data. Um, one other thing, um, we only care about the last results, uh, the last. Um, a set of results from the probe, so we don't store any historical data, um, because ultimately we didn't care what was happening in the past, we only care about what's happening now. Is Edgeron working now? Um, from feedback from the community in the UK, uh, the UK had actually liked some historical data, so it's likely that we'll change that in future and start storing the test results uh, as well. Um, and then finally, the probes report back over Regirome, so it does everything over the wireless, does it, you don't plug it into a wired network, it's reporting over Regirome. Um, so if you don't have Regirome working, your probe shows as being offline. And here you can see, this is the, the web interface, and um, you can see that these are all the sites currently which have a probe, these are part of the trial. And you can see that they're all online at the moment, and there's a couple there which have got a warn next to them. So if all the tests pass, you'll see an OK in the checks box. And if a test has failed or multiple tests have failed, uh, it'll come up as a warn. And probes belong to an organization, so the probe is tied to an organization, but the probe is actually registered to a location. So these are all the probes are tied to locations in the UK uh, database. Um, so if I look at, for example, one of the Loughborough probes, because you can have multiple probes for an, uh, an organization, so this is one of the probes that's um, location is main building Hollywell Park. And you can see there that it's split into two sections. So the top section is stuff which must um, pass. So these are tests which are part of what we call the technical specification compliance. So if these fail, that site, that service provider isn't meeting the UK specification. And then at the bottom, we've got information only checks. And those are things which aren't part of the specification, but are nice to know. So you can see there we've got some PEEP checks, some TTLS checks, uh, correct use of the Edge Your Own SSID, so there's no capital E, no extra bits on the end of it or on the beginning of it, um, whether the site's using WPA2 AES, um, and NTP, uh, because that's a requirement uh, on the UK spec. And then in the information only, we've got there things like NAT, RFC 1918 in use, and WPA in use. Um, so that's about it. Well done. Uh, Excellently done. I'll handle that. Yeah, so the, uh, the next speaker is one of five student poster presentation speakers that we have. Uh, so I remind you to uh, get out your little stickers and go and vote on the student posters which are downstairs. Um, the bottom level, past the vendor, uh, right? Past, past the vendors? Does everyone know where the posters are? I think it's about there. That's where you should go. Now I'm trying to find... Second last one. Lost the second last one. Lost presenter, lost files. There we go. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. There you go. So, I'm Martin. I'm going to tell you something about a project that we've been doing for the past year. Uh, we were at TNC last year as well. Then we just had the idea for the project. Uh, we've worked it out uh, and we're continuously working on it. Uh, it's called Reflow. It's a project at the University of Twente at the Ducks Group. And uh, as you can see, the name suggests reports on internet flow data. Um, the system makes reports every week about multiple data sources that we have in the system about internet. So you can say something about how internet is uh, progressing, what is happening at different locations, etc. cetera. Uh, this idea actually started at Internet2 in America. Um, from 2002, they started a project on their network uh, about, uh, they posted statistics on a website 
so they said something about which protocols were used, um, which type of uh, internet protocols were used. And they had several graphs saying something about um, flows, how long they lasted, uh, what kind of packets were sent, the throughput, etc. So they posted this on their website every week. Uh, was very interesting. Uh, lots of papers made references to it, big papers. Uh, but they stopped at their pro with their project in 2010. Uh, the website is actually not available anymore now. Uh, so we figured a new source of this kind of information was necessary. So we started Reflow. Um, the system that will once again do this. Um, but instead of doing this over one network, we wanted to make it over multiple networks. So we can say something about internet in general, maybe even worldwide if we can get, get enough sources in there. So the system is made up out of several phases. First phase, of course, is collecting all the data. Uh, this is NetFlow data, and uh, we collect it from a couple of sources right now. So that's uh, DAIC from Denmark, Chesnet from the Czech Republic, um, University of Twente, of course, ourselves, uh, RMP from Brazil, we had connections there, and uh, Geant, connecting the NRANs in Europe. Um, we're ready to expand into a lot more sources and we have a lot of contact, um, but we were developing the system the past year. Um, when we collect all the NetFlow data, or the providers themselves collect the NetFlow data, we generate the reports. The reports contain several statistics, very basic statistics, um, how long do flows last, which protocols are used, etc., etc. Um, these statistics are calculated, then they are put into a JSON file. Uh, this is the report, and the report um, is then sent to us. So all the NetFlow files together are maybe a couple of gigabytes. The uh, report file that is sent to us is only 80 megabytes maybe. So it's very easy, we don't have to transfer loads of files to make our analyses. Um, when the report file is sent to us, we put it into a database, uh, we store it locally, and um, then, of course, we want to do something with all the data. So uh, we've made a website that visualizes all these reports. Looks a bit like this. Um, we're expanding that, make it, making it more usable uh, as well. So you can see all the different data sources that are connected to us, and you can see all uh, their reports per week. And none of this data is any sensitive data. It's very high level, so it just contains a percentage of um, how much TCP traffic was there, how much UDP traffic was there, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so you can actually see this on the website right now. Um, we're, of course, trying to expand. We want to add a lot more data sources so we can say something about the internet in general, and not just about the internet in Brazil and Holland, of course. Um, we want to keep the project running, so if there's more data in there, we can see how internet progresses over time. Uh, compare views, maybe you want to see how Holland and Brazil differ in their internet usages. And um, of course, provide an aggregate view, so you can see in the internet in general, how much UDP traffic is uh, there in, uh, compared to TCP, for example. Uh, if you're interested in our project, come by our poster. Um, I'm there. Talk to us if you have any good ideas on how we can expand this, if you have ideas on how you could use it, if you have ideas on where we can get more data. We're always interested. Um, our email addresses are also there, so you can go there. And of course, you can go to the website, which is uh, stats.simpleweb.org. Thank you. <coughs> I'm just checking who we have next. Sven. Okay. Powering through the presentations, we're a little bit behind schedule, such as life. So shaving 30 seconds off people's presentations is. Uh, Sven, Sven, no, we can kill Stephens, right? Nicole has actually suggested that we just randomly select presentations, and uh, next year you just get whatever uh, whatever pops up next. No, da, 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 da. no, not open cache. No, I do that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where, where do we lose? Did we lose your presentation, Sven? Yeah, here we go. I was so close earlier on. Hello, everybody. My name is Sven Stauber. I'm working for Switch in a team called Interaction Enabling. 
we are providing IT shared services to Swiss universities. One of our services is called SwitchCast. That's a lecture recording service that has been built by Switch. And while offering lecture recording as a service to our customer helps to reduce their risks and their costs, we found ourselves more and more in a position where we cannot maintain and further develop such a complex system solely by ourselves in a sustainable manner. To make this one a short one, we have decided that OpenCast Matterhorn will be the technology used in our future <coughs> SwitchCast next generation lecture recording service that will be online in mid of 2015. I'm not talking about the product OpenCast Matterhorn a lot here, so it's an open lecture capture and video management system <coughs> for education. I mean, it can do all the stuff you need for lecture recording, shadowing, <coughs> capturing, editing, publishing, all that. The point is that we have decided that we will use this one. This is an ongoing project that started last autumn. So uh, in this lightning talk, I'd like to present you some of our first impressions. So the community hide that project, the open cost community. Oops, sorry. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now my timer is away. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Uh, the open cost community is a very well established, very well organized community that is behind this project. Uh, there are many opportunities for collaboration with other higher education institutions that are participating in this open cost Matterhorn project. Uh, we, for example, when we the first time had a look at open cost Matterhorn, we have found that it actually does not meet our requirements. So in particular, for example, we want a different web interface, completely different one. Um, what a surprise. We are not alone. We found some partners that we could team up together. And now we are building this new web interface, not alone, but in collaboration with others. Um, meanwhile, OpenCast Matterhorn has proven itself reliable and scalable in production environments. To give you just one example here, the University of Manchester, UK, is using Matterhorn to record and process 200 hours of video per day. There is a lot of progress in the community, so not just a lot of activity and talking, but also a lot of progress considering the product, a lot of development. So I have an idea of, us, of what is uh, upcoming in the next 12 months, and it's really a lot. We could never ever do this ourselves. There's a whole ecosystem growing in this multi-form community. So there are companies providing professional services. There are vendors shipping products with Matterhorn support. There are other open source projects that interface with Matterhorn. To give you a few examples, so Gallicaster, for example, is an open source capture agent. It's an impressive project. Uh, Paya Player is a HTML5 multi-stream video player. I mean, there's really a whole ecosystem growing there. Generally, there's growth. I mean, community is getting bigger. Community is getting bigger. Uh, more adapters, more institution participating in this collaboration. And finally, the whole point of all these bubbles is there is an established global community-driven collaboration to get this complex system, so lecture recording and video management, done in a collaboration. So if you think that together we could achieve more, join the open cost community, go there, have a look at it, and help to shape the lecture recording and video management system of the future. Twitch already does. And by the way, Motorhorn is a mountain too. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sven. Sorry for the, well, it's your own mobile phone uh, error. Anyway. Um, 
Why, why won't you go away? Very good. Uh, we now have uh, Luke, who is our second uh, student poster presentation. You wouldn't have seen uh, Luke at the uh, first uh, coffee break because uh, both Luke and Martin were touring the Irish countryside. Um, but they're now with us and uh, able to speak. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Luke Hendricks. I'm a PhD student from the University of Twente. Uh, indeed, we have some delay, so I'll get started quickly. Um, I'm here to present my work from the last, say, two and a half, three years, uh, which is called Secure. Um, and this is a SSH intrusion detection system. Now, when I say SSH intrusion detection system, you might say, yeah, we already got these in, in several forms. Um, yes, that's true, but I beg to differ if it's like ours, because most SSH intrusion detection systems work on an end host basis. And doing it like this makes it hardly scalable. If you have one host you want to protect, you install filter band, no problem, it works. If you have two hosts, you install filter band twice. <coughs> if you have 10,000 hosts, you can install FilterBand 10,000 times, but it gets a bit annoying to install and maintain all these things. So what we do with Secure is we move the detection from the end host into the network. And that way we can do the detection on the flow level, and it, it gives us certain edges. Um, you only have to install our system one time, and you can monitor your whole network instead of installing something like filter one uh, 60,000 times. But there is more. How interested are you in, let's say, 99% of the SSH attacks you see on your servers or on your uh, devices? Most of those will not be successful and therefore they will only create noise in your log files and noise in your monitoring <coughs> systems. What you are interested in is that one attack that is successful, that one attack that does compromise your system. And that's what we do. We do compromise detection and we do it all flow based. So our solution is scalable. Well, um, that means two things. Like I said, you only have to install it once instead of n times for n hosts. Um, but it's based on NetFlow, which is more scalable than, say, packet-based approaches by itself, by nature. Uh, furthermore, and this is kind of a freebie if you use NetFlow things, uh, certainly for SSH, it's privacy preserving. Well, in the case of SSH, you cannot do any kind of uh, deep packet inspection, but using NetFlow, you only analyze the headers of the network traffic, and therefore you, uh, well, you don't interfere with the payload, um, which is an important thing. Uh, furthermore, like I said, it's, it's easily deployable because you only have to install it one time, but I will get back to that in the next slide. So detecting attacks that are heading towards your network is one thing, and it's an important thing. But maybe, and especially for the audience here, um, the other way around is even more important. Are there attacks originating from my network, right? If there are IPs or, I mean, hosts in your network scanning ranges from other networks or brute forcing hosts on other networks, you might get blacklisted. Your whole network might get blacklisted. And uh, you get a whole lot of trouble just because there is one infected machine in your network. So by doing these things network-based, using flow data, you don't have to be the target anymore to use a detection system. You can be in a network and which way the attack goes it doesn't matter, but we can analyze it, we can detect it. So it works both ways. So something more technical on the implementation side, as I said, it is easily deployable. Um, and in this case, that means we implemented it as a plugin for NFSN. That's a NetFlow framework by Peter Haag. Um, it's, well, widely used in the community. <laughs> And um, <coughs> those who know it know that you have to code in Perl for this, and multi-threading in Perl is, well, not optimal, so to say. Um, so we don't use multi-threading. We use asynchronous code, event-based code, if you will. So all your multi-core machines um, can make use of secure in an efficient way. On top of that, there is a simple, comprehensible web interface to see which hosts were attacked in my network, uh, which hosts were attacking in my network, etc. 
The code is tested on a range of different operating systems, so some Linux versions, FreeBSD, and OpenBSD, um, and we try to use as well, yeah, as little dependencies as necessary. So in this case, it's actually only SQLite that you need, which again makes it easily deployable for everyone. So as of today, the new beta version two of course available. So of course, and if you want to help us out, we have the 30 second survey. It's at the poster which should be there, um, almost there, I hope. Um, those are real basic questions on your flow usage and stuff. And I'll bring an X next year. Uh, yes. It's, <laughs> it's really 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Yes. So the bonus is we don't have time for questions, but yes. Uh, please spend some time visiting our student uh, poster presentations. Uh, I'm now cutting into Jan Meyer's time. I'll just start him off now. Hi. And, uh... <coughs> All right, I'll stop talking then. Um, Jan Meyer works for Uninet, the Norwegian NREN. I'm also a project lead for an open source project called FileSender. And I managed to misspell sovereignty, but uh, then again, English is not my native language. Um, sovereignty is defined as having control over usually a certain piece of land. And you have absolute control. In Ireland, it's the Irish people that have absolute control over the uh, ground in Ireland. <laughs> and <laughs> this. Oh, man, you're cutting in my time. Stop this. <laughs> in Norway, the Swedes don't decide. Norwegians make the laws, we decide, we control them. However, sovereignty is only sovereignty if you can actually enforce it. If the Swedes would still say, well, you can do whatever you want, but if we don't like it, we'll invade, that is not true sovereignty. And I'm here to make you think about why data sovereignty might be important. Mr. Snowden reminded us about this, but this is nothing new. Every human group in every political game that we've played, they've always used whatever leverage they have to get their way. Now, there are a couple of juggernauts in the world. <laughs> um, they are big around to throw their weight around and usually get their way. So far, this didn't really matter for data because that was stored locally anyway. However, long-term trends all point towards centralization. We call this cloud computing. That all of a sudden means that if you're a smaller country, there is a significant chance that the data ends up in some other country's sovereign space. Now, do you still have data sovereignty at that point? Are you still the sole master of your data if all your data is stored in a country where you ultimately don't have any control. Laws regulate a lot of this. We have seen plenty of examples where laws <coughs> don't regulate everything. And especially when push comes to shove, it's national interests that prevail. And remember what the Russians did a couple of years ago, midwinter, because they had a conflict with the Ukraine. Several European countries were two weeks in the cold because the cranes were shut. The same thing could happen with the aggregate data that you use in higher education and research. If you collect all this in one big store, hey, that's going pretty well. Um, if you collect all this in one big store, it's not hard to imagine that someone could cut you off from your data thus disrupting a rather crucial service, which is your higher education and research. This is where FileSender does a little bit for you. It doesn't solve all the questions. Um, <coughs> FileSender allows you to build a large file transfer service. You upload a file, recipient downloads the file. From an NREN point of view, it takes all the right boxes. What that boils down to is a very low cost way for building your own large file uh, file transfer service within your own sovereign domain. So you don't have to give up your data sovereignty when it comes to stuff like this. So for those of you who don't have a file server, file sender server yet, this is something that you might want to consider. So file sender, because your data is for your spies only. Um, <laughs> if, if you're interested, if you want to know where the project is going, um, more information to be get uh, gathered tomorrow at the Nordinet booth. Um, we didn't manage to set up a proper uh, BOF, 
Um, but um, I think the common consensus is that we'll head off to the pub and discuss files under them. Um, you can also check the websites or find me or Guido and talk about this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan. I never realised five minutes could be so long. <laughs> the not <laughs> even five. The, guy, the guy squeezes ten minutes into four minutes and thirty seconds. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, I feel so much older. I know, I know. So, so lightning talks are not only to give you a, a taster of all of the concepts that are going on in our community, but also who to avoid talking to at tonight's opening reception. Uh, remember to bring your badges uh, so that you can get in. That was a good reason for doing it, right? Next we have, uh, I think, third student. Am I counting correctly? Third student, uh, Matthew. <laughs> That's what I was figuring out yet. <laughs> We're looking for a speaker with enormous amounts of hair. <laughs> I have a quick reason. <laughs> Ready for it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> there you go. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Matthew Brobin. I'm a second year PhD student at Lancaster University, just over the pond in the UK. Um, I'm not going to make any joke about Northern <laughs> Ireland, that's not my place. Um, <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> um, so, first of all, um, I'm here today to present you OpenCache, uh, which is uh, something I'm developing as part of my PhD. And I just really want to start by motivating that. So, here's a nice picture taken from uh, the Cisco VNI. Uh, which shows the, the e expansion of video traffic in terms of the modern internet traffic profile and the large part that that's playing in, um, in the actual overall, the overall picture of traffic on the internet today. But this is not just a case of more traffic. The actual way that video is delivered is, is changing. So we're moving away from things like Flash, more towards using uh, regular HTTP servers. Um, we're also moving away from having just one uh, quarter level available to, to adaptive bitrate <coughs> streaming, which means that we can basically swap between bitrates during playback uh, depending on how much bandwidth the, the client itself sees. Um, depending on which technology it is, this might be a segmented file, uh, byte ranges, but basically you describe a single chunk that, that is a, of a certain bitrate and you move between these sim simply by requesting the, the different bitrate. But this actually creates new challenges in terms of content delivery. Um, caches themselves, so existing caches, so things like Squid, um, don't take into consideration the fact that these quality levels, um, sorry, that you can swap between these quality levels. So for example, if you have uh, the 1080p version of a video and then the 720p, this in, in, a, in a traditional cache will be stored twice, which we think is a waste of cache space. Um, this combined with the fact that um, at the moment they tend to use uh, URLs as the unique identifier for a file in a cache and um, when, you, when you use CDNs, uh, something like YouTube that uses Google's infrastructure obviously, um, they tend to duplicate the same content because it resolves to different URLs even though the content itself might be uh, completely, completely the same. Um, so we developed OpenCache. Um, which is a distributed caching platform. Um, we developed a, a, an API um, that's, that's well documented, well defined, um, that allows a content provider, a content creator, a network operator to actually define the content that they want to store. And using this, they can actually add content that um, might be at multiple URLs, but will only be stored once in the cache in order to increase the cache efficiency. Um, it also allows for some cool things in terms of um, adding caches, so adding caches on the fly in a data center scenario. And um, it also is a centralized platform, so you basically have a single cache controller and a number of nodes connect to this and you can control those nodes through that single controller. Um, this was originally developed as a way for experimenters, not myself, but other, other teams at our university, to, uh, to work with different cache selection policies, cache replacement policies, cache location. Um, but I, I wanted more. I, I like networking, I'm a networker. Um, so we looked at ways we could actually uh, do the caching differently. So we looked at software defined networking. Uh, some people might not be aware of what this is yet, but um, it basically you decouple the data and control planes in switching hardware. Um, or, or software actually, if it's a 
software switch, and you move the control plane to a user who can then control how the network itself behaves, how things are switched. Um, we use OpenFlow because it's the dominant implementation, uh, but basically it exposes this vendor agnostic API that allows you to exploit um, the actual, the behavior of the switch. So OpenCache itself uses OpenFlow, uh, uses OpenFlow to redirect the requests. We can also pull metrics from the OpenFlow switches, um, which allows us to get, uh, do things like real-time load balancing of the switches, um, of, the, of OpenCache. And we can also decide which cache node the, the flows are redirected to on the fly um, and at the network layer rather than at the application layer on our actual nodes. So just to finish off, we've actually deployed this on the Ophelia project, which was an EU FP7 project that rounded up at the end of the last year. We've now deployed it on the Xeon OpenFlow facility and developed some cool new features. Thanks for listening to my talk. Please check my poster out. It's at the student one, which is actually that way rather than that way. So oh, it is. Yeah. You're correcting the chair? Oh, yeah, fine. By all means. You might be right, but that's no excuse. The next speaker up, uh, Brian Nisbet. This is going to be five scary, scary minutes because he's the guy who's single handedly upholding the technical infrastructure of this uh, entire conference. And instead of using those hands to hold it up, he's now going to use those hands to entertain you. I hope it's worthwhile for you guys. <laughs> Go. So, um, hello, experimentation in the live network, by which I do not mean what we've been doing to Edgerome uh, and, the, uh, and the, the, the wireless interference so far today. Should be fixed, I hope it is. Any more problems, please let me know after this. So, um, Fido Fido and Aaron, long, long ago in Ireland, uh, this was our network. This is roughly 10 years ago. Life was a lot simpler then. Um, static HTML, we're talking about internet usage back 10 years ago was important, it wasn't vital. Most pages were just there. There wasn't any streaming video. Um, and you know, you're talking about maybe 70 meg to a university. And we generally knew about an outage before our clients did. We picked up the phone and go, you're having a problem. They go, oh, oh, yes, yes we are. Um, this was a much freer time, a gentler time, a lovelier time uh, for the for the HGA net knock. Um, no, no, we've already apparently annexed Northern Ireland today, so we should probably <laughs> stop that. Um, don't worry, Jan, I've, I've already told the unionists they'll be down later to talk to you. Although they're orange, so you should get along very well. Anyway, um, we had very dangerous habits at the time. Uh, we did all sorts of crazy things. We dual stacked networks, IPv6. What a crazy idea. Um, core and access upgrades in one day. What another crazy idea. What could possibly go wrong? Um, we had a freedom to experiment, uh, not play, obviously. Um, things are very, very different now. Um, we have VLEs, we have YouTube, we have all sorts of things like that. So we wanted to reduce equipment use, save money. We, we have an official project, which is Juniper CPE-based thing, to virtual CPE to reduce the amount of kit we did. But during a meeting, I said, hey, it'd be great if we could save some money. And my team just went and did it. Uh, which is great. They should do this more often. It saves, my, it saves me a lot of time and hassle. Um, so we came up with the Skunks Works project, which was to experiment on the live network. Several of my clients are in this room. They don't like when we do this. Uh, so they get very picky. But we decided to do this in a properly controlled manner, which is what we can do these days. Because apparently, if they can't get onto Facebook, they get very twitchy. Um, it's a Cisco ME3400, which is the, the metro, metro Ethernet switch we use on our Layer 2 network. And we split it into a Layer 2 and a Layer 3. Layer 2 switch, Layer 3 router, uh, a swooter, clearly. Um, it needed to fit into our provisioning system, which is very squirreled away from the internet. Um, and it also needs to be on our Layer 3 uh, network, which is, by function, not squirreled away from the internet. Uh, so two VRFs connected by a really ugly Ethernet cable in the middle of it. Didn't work at first. Oh boy, did it not work at first. Apparently 20 meg is not enough for a client in the 21st century. And it was 20 very dodgy megs at that as well. Authentication was a huge problem. It was trying to fit the, the different needs that we had for the two different networks. Monitoring was like, oof, no idea what's going on. Multicast didn't work. Now. Who honestly could tell? Um, 
<laughs> but apparently it's important. I keep on telling people it's important. Um, security was, was a bit strange. There was long ACLs that required lots of time in the lab. Lots of time was spent in the lab. We now have about 500 meg off this box, which is a huge, huge increase. iOS changed, changed some, some of the SDM templates, which I can show people configs if they want to see them. We did have a small security issue, by which I mean the entire router was compromised. But that was in the lab, so that's OK. Uh, we got authentication working, so we now have the automatic provisioning tool logging into the right bit of the VRF. We have the other bit, just over a minute, yes. Um, and we have monitoring working, although that did show us this does add a millisecond to smoke ping. And I'm waiting for the first students to claim they can tell me how much difference a millisecond works to whatever Snapchatting they're doing at any given point in time. Um, the images stay for a millisecond longer in the NSA's cache forever. Um, they're on the live network. They're perfect for clients that need more than uh, 100 meg, but less than 500 meg. Upgrading from, from Cisco 2821, so who doesn't like that? And there are full SLAs for all of them. We save money. We save power. It was a bottom-up project, engineer-led, completely off their, their own thing. And we got to experiment in a fully SLA'd setup on the live network. I encourage any of you in these situations to let, if you don't really let your engineers do stuff like this, let them keep them in the lab for a long time first, but do let them do it. And uh, it's always a very useful thing. Talk to me any more about it. There I am. Thank you very much. What a fabulous job. Thank you very much. Is Savio the next one? Yes. Ah, and he knows. There he is now. Fantastic. Um, slides? Oh, I can't. This is your laptop. It's not my laptop. Oh. I actually, it's been so long since I've driven Windows that it's like, what? What are these buttons? What are these two buttons? Do? We're running out of people, right? So we must be getting really close. Is this a pointer? Yes. So this is not you. Yes. 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 Pull it backward. Yeah, no, you just point at the end. Here we go. This is the right one. Magic. Wah! Dutchman in the way. Okay, good morning, good <laughs> afternoon everybody. I will just uh, want to discuss uh, with you about the new network services that, that will be rolled out this year, the multi-domain VPN services. Uh, yeah, what, what? This one? Okay, I will just explain a little bit how it works. So this is uh, services that uh, provide VPN, all type of VPN, layer 2 VPN, point to point, layer 2 VPN, multi-point uh, VPLS or layer 3 VPN. What is new here is that it's providing not in one domain that is uh, originally done, but it's able to provide this VPN of a different domain. And in fact, NDVPN is providing a seamless infrastructures. So if you look uh, uh, at the services, the border of the services is not at the border of Giant or Nordinet, it is at the border of the NUN or even at the border of the regional network or at, uh, in the metro, uh, metropolitan networks. So the data is delivered to the, to the end users uh, at, the, at the edge of the NUN and then the data is, uh, well, let's say, encapsulated into a VPN and goes through the, through the NUN. Then, then this, NUN, this uh, uh, VPN is uh, extended through the different, uh, uh, through the different domain uh, and thanks to what we call the SSP, a service teaching point. And through this service teaching point, we are able to go through the different domain. What is very, very important <laughs> is that this service teaching point is only set up once. And once you are created, this service teaching point, which is very simple, it's simply a BGP label unicast. It's a BGP label pairing that you set up in the very same interface that you use for your general IP or for your connection with, with Giant. When you have created this BGP pairing, you are able to be connected and to set up any layer 2 or layer 3 VPN to all other NRN or regional network that is connected to these infrastructures. You can also use for in your national way. For instance, if you have regional network, you can use it to interconnect the different mm, uh, regional network and provide uh, VPN through, through your own domain. What is also the source that provides you high scalability? When you want to create uh, a VPN, you just have to create at the edge and say, okay, this guy is in the VPN green or this guy is in the VPN in the VPN uh, red. Yeah. 
so, of course, the lead time is, is reduced a lot. You saved OPEX because you have not to create a lot of things. And it's very flexible because you are able, we are able to connect even sites that is not that is hosted in a uh, NREN that uh, uh, in not taking part into MDVPN thanks to a technology that is called VPN proxy. And we are also able to collaborate with external uh, partners like uh, American or ASEAN thanks to the VPN proxy. So you don't have any new investment to, to, do, to do because it's mainly built on standard BGP on MVLS. We uh, have a very good take-up because now we, are implement we have implemented on our production routers. It's now deployed in 14 uh, NREN and 5 NREN also committed to connect it. We have right now a first big, big uh, research project that is, that is uh, using these this infrastructures on what it is providing for your end users it's mainly you are able to provide point-to-point -point layer 2 VPN, VPLS and layer 3 VPN. And that will provide a kind of safer environment for your end users where they can build their science without be disturbing by pirates or whatever and so on. So, so for instance, they can avoid to use firewall on things like this. So which will be the users? It will be uh, there is a large scope of, of, of usage from cloud, create big infrastructures, distributed infrastructures, and also, <coughs> and also a, 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 a quick point-to-point -point connection. But what would be more interesting for you is also for network experimentation. If, thanks to this infrastructure, you are able to build a distributed uh, layer 2 or layer 3 VPN, layer 2 v v connectivity or layer 3 connectivity. So, it could be very useful for, for any new uh, activity. If you are very interested, please, uh, you can go, go to the poster. I will be happy to answer you. Thank you. OK, we now have our fourth student uh, poster person. Notice, notice the digressions. Not only is the chair being corrected, there's people manning the clock now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You want to start yourself? Okay. Yeah, by all means, sure. Yeah. How many minutes? Yeah. It's just, um, you can buy extra minutes. <laughs> <laughs> He's <Fine>. on. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm Daniel Gija from I2CAT in Barcelona, and I'm going to talk to you about real-time quality of service Pathfinder. It is an SDN application that we have been developing to uh, embed in Oferti project using um, OpenNAS framework. Um, it only started because uh, our motivation was that real-time applications and services uh, more and more demand um, custom and dynamic end-to-end um, -end quality of service. So uh, we needed to find a way to, uh, to, to get the opportunities that uh, SDN and concretely OpenFlow offer us. And here is a proposal that, the, thanks to, to the ASEAN's OpenFlow implementation, we researched it um, to develop a traffic engineering and quality of service algorithm to build up a real-time ASEAN application to uh, get a solution based on the network access service paradigm. Our approach. Uh, it, it makes use of an external model built on top of an SEN controller, and it works in a less greedy algorithm approach. Um, we call it less greedy because in, in reality, it's, it's, it's a greedy algorithm, but we make use of mechanisms to make it less greedy. And we achieve that not only uh, making a pathfinding of a shorter past a short, shortest path uh, routing, um, we make, um, we try to, to find feasible paths uh, considering network-wide traffic and the optimal global solution end-to-end -end, uh, on the network. Our main goals are to provide uh, applications of dynamic and on-demand provisioning of network resources to provide real-time quality of service over an open flow network. 
uh, which is this uh, adapting the control plane to meet the quality of service requirements and uh, on on demand configuration of the forwarding plane. Um, this benefits us because uh, Pathfinder as the app enables real time applications uh, to dynamically demand uh, custom and end to end quality of service uh, paths and meet the applications to, to provide the clients, uh, for example, um, real time content, meeting uh, these application requirements uh, and constraints. Uh, list, the the list grid approach uh, mainly avoids routing through links that could be potentially congested uh, by network traffic, for example, based off of traffic, and it considers minimum hop count, requested bottleneck or additive quality of service parameters. Open the application requirement changes, um, we make use of automa automatically uh, generation of flow rules to install over an end-to-end -end path on the network, and, and we try to, to get the, the QoS request on demand and in real-time dynamic reconfiguration of a network path if necessary. Furthermore, uh, the app architecture allows us to make use of custom arrow rhythms and to, thanks to external other applications built on top of the SDN controller, we can um, use um, the network state monitorization by retrieving uh, statistics and, and we can um, then um, use mechanisms like event triggering to reroute uh, if one of our QoS paths uh, have a violation. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about a bit uh, of, of our, our implementation. Um, the, the algorithm starts with a client request and then it, it makes a real-time uh, abstraction of the topology and it uh, adapts it to a, um, a, an, a graph extraction of the network and makes a acknowledgement of the attachment points and transforms the links to edges and the switches to nodes. Um, to find the path, uh, our algorithm is simple. It makes the steps should be here. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. This are some preliminary results that we we tested. Oh well, and thank you for listening. And I hope uh, that you can come back to, to the A2CAD booth and to the, the poster for further information. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Professionally nice, professionally nice, whatever the David, people. where's David gone? Oh, all the way up there. Decided to waste, burn some of his time by wow. doing the big reveal entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect shuffle. Okay, hey, and the, which key? I think space works. Does that one? Okay. Yeah. Nobody's used to these more these windows. I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, Off okay. you go. Uh, my name is David McLaughlin. I work at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, and I'm talking about user account phishing attacks on universities, which have increased massively in the last three years. And the reason for that is, of course, money. Uh, banks and credit card companies, two years ago, they lost one and a half billion dollars. Last year, they lost six billion dollars. So, user account uh, phishing attacks on universities. They're collecting user accounts, obviously. They're collecting them on a massive scale, 18 million stolen accounts found on a German machine recently. Uh, they want to use our mail to send, our infrastructure to send their mail. They do this to avoid IP blacklisting. They do this to avoid other forms of filtering. Uh, we are a natural target because we've got a large pool of very inexperienced users and we're not likely to blacklist other universities. These things are very difficult to stop using traditional filtering because they can come from external accounts. They can come also from internal accounts, which is a very interesting way to start your morning. Uh, we experience several attacks per day, sometimes a few hundred, sometimes several thousand. 
the methods they use, they use sort of generic things like, you know, your mailbox is full, whatever, PayPal accounts. But the sophisticated ones study our web pages. They send messages using the names of people at the university. They use copies of our login pages. This is one done by a guy who works down the hall from me. Well, in his name, anyway. Uh, here's our login page sitting on a server in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, anyway, so the things come down to your mailbox, hit the mail client, the student or whoever, including various high-ranking officials, gets sucked in, they send their username and password, and then the users have got it. So, they use universities to fish other universities, as some of you may have seen or some of your customers may have uh, been talking about. What do they do with them? Of course, they use them for sending spam, for sending fish, for sending malware. They use them for setting up phishing web pages, like we saw on the Zimbabwe server. They hold some of them in reserve for later use, and they sell the others. So what can we do? Well, education, inspections, monitoring, whatever's neutralizing the uh, URLs, et cetera. Uh, individually, uh, websites, uh, newsletters, articles, whatever we can do to get it across to our community. Phishing web pages, web pages showing the latest uh, phishing attacks, successful or not. Uh, we have an inbound inspection queue called the Fish Trap, which is uh, looking for various keywords and whatever's trending at that moment. Uh, we also are going to have to filter outbound mail. We're going to have to filter mail internal to the mail server. This is all very, very labor intensive. It's all uh, expensive in terms of manpower. Uh, it requires tools to do it efficiently. Uh, you have to monitor HTTP traffic and mail traffic, HTTP traffic to see if a page is suddenly getting a bunch of hits. Maybe it's a phishing, uh, maybe it's a phishing web page. Looking at suddenly somebody sending a huge number of messages when they normally don't. Looking at somebody getting a lot of non-deliveries. We do things like geotracing of logins. Uh, you need a way of neutralizing URLs, such as like redirecting to a warning page that says, you fool, whatever, you know. Uh, setting a daily limit on the number of messages that can be sent. This is something that did not occur to a large English university, and they said, why didn't we think of this? Uh, anyway. Uh, telling people, hey, you may have been fished, locking their accounts when you know they've been fished, and keeping a password history to prevent them from setting their stupid password back, uh, which happened. Uh, anyway, we even removed them from people's mailboxes. Uh, the last thing is uh, minimizing the reaction time. That means like letting your help desk do this, which is a scary thought, but they're, we've been doing it and they're good at it. Uh, anyway, and what else? Oh, yes. Uh, get advice from your NREN. We are uh, blessed with a very particularly good NREN who does help us, and we like that. We like to exchange experiences with other universities, and we would like some help from Terena. <clears throat> and that's it. And how was that? <laughs> Thank you, David. In fact, I can do a very quick summary of uh, Simeon's presentation here because, because the location of the Square Kilometre Array is Australia. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, apparently, apparently there's some dispute about that. That's the so, talk ever. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, hi, um, I'm Simeon. I like the slide says, um, uh, I am from one half of the South African in ring. Um, and I'm going to talk about this thing, which is really like a toilet roll view of one of the questions that's being asked currently for the square kilometre array. Um, so first I'm going to grab your attention, I hope, with some pretty pictures because it's going to get a little bit more boring later on. Um, this is actually uh, the site where the core of the Meerkat is being built, which is the precursor to the square kilometre array uh, project in the desert in South Africa. I haven't been there. This guy over here, one of my colleagues, has been there recently to install some kit. Um, it's a, a holiday trip which I'm planning. Um, other uh, exciting things happening, this is the first Meerkat dish which is being rolled out, um, being built. So the point of these slides really is that there's some exci exciting radio astronomy science which is happening in Africa. Um, and what I'm actually going to talk about is 
the location of the supercomputer that is meant to process the data of the SKA. So a very simple architecture. This is how it looks. Um, there are dishes, they receive signals, they then go into a very specialized bit of hardware called a correlator, which has an output of about 27 terabits per second, apparently. Um, that goes into a supercomputer, which generates images, essentially, and then that is more or less the end product. That is what goes to the astronomers and the scientists. Now, we were asked to um, give some inputs into what is the cost of transporting data around the desert and perhaps the Cape Town. Um, and it turns out there is a trade-off um, which needs to be made about the location of the supercomputer. Do we build it in the desert, which is where the radio telescope is? Do we build it in the nearest city, large city, which is Cape Town, or somewhere in between? Um, and this is something which the SKA people are currently working on. So this, as I said, it's a toilet roll issue. We're really looking at um, what is the cost for transporting the data. Um, six potential sites were looked at. Um, and. Uh, this is a more or less a, a diagram which shows the, the layout. So we've got Cape Town in the bottom there. Um, it's not really to scale. Um, there's a core site, uh, which is where the dishes are currently being built and which, where the correlator will be. Then um, some kilometers away, 45, well, actually more like close to 90 kilometers away, there's a farm, literally a farmhouse that's being converted into the support base for the telescope. Um, and then there's a town. And then there's a link which runs along the highway back to Cape Town. And currently, there's a 10 gigabit circuit that we've built uh, for the Meerkat project. So the question is, now, when we build the data center, where do we build it? So that little star that you see which says number one, that's the first option. Build the supercomputer close to the dish. And uh, the trade-off there is really about transporting 27 terabits back to, um, to the data center or uh, moving the power around, because power is a major issue. So the second option is to build um, a new site, uh, which probably needs to be done anyway, because there needs to be a new power line built in any case in order to provide power for the correlator component. So that's one option. Uh, another option is to actually build it at the support base, which is great, because um, in terms of RF interference, the site is far away enough that you can maybe build it in a cheaper way. Perhaps you don't have to bury the data center under the ground. Um, then there's another option, which is to build it in the nearest town, which is called Carnarvon. Um, and a fifth option, which is to build it in a town, which is really in the middle of nowhere, but it happens to be close to one of the power substations called Prisca. And quite finally, um, you could actually build it in Cape Town. And as you can imagine, the cost of transporting 27 terabits in terms of equipment and power and that sort of stuff scales up as you move it further away from the core site. So those are the six options. Um, and uh, we were then, we went on a request for information to industry and we asked them, so what does it cost to transport 27 terabit to Cape Town? And first they said, are you serious? Um, and then you said, yes, we're serious. And eventually we get, got some responses. Um, almost all of which are covered by NDAs. They don't want to tell the rest of the world really how much uh, they think it's going to cost to transport that. But this is an idea more or less of the responses we got. So I've split this into two ellipses. The one represents the two terabit option. Um, if you build the data center uh, in the desert and you transport the output of the supercomputer to Cape Town, then uh, you have this, um, those dots at the bottom. And then you could get dark fiber, which is in the square. And then you can go for the 27 terabit option, which, as you can see, is very expensive. And there's quite a gap between the dark fiber and the cheapest 27 terabit option. They play cricket, they get more time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We never allow uh, questions, but I have one unanswered question. Yes. What is this thing with toilet paper issue? I know the issue when you get to the toilet roll and there's no paper left, but are you saying that this is a, you have two options? <laughs> uh, toilets is a very sensitive political subject in South Africa. <laughs> so I wonder, it would be, yes. And may be a reason for actually speaking to Simeon in the opening uh, reception. Right. We've now uh, got uh, our last student poster presentation and our penultimate speaker for uh, this evening.
Team, that was me. Teamwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, how, what do we do? Oh, you, you do it magically from there, right? And you have yeah, a clicky. Okay. Yeah, I think so. It's all good. Okay, my name is Jessica Steinberger. I'm going to present you my initial idea of a PhD work, which is done with the University of Twente. And it's about real-time DDoS defense. So let's have a short look um, about the motivation. Uh, wonderful. So. Um, you find a lot of information or research done in detecting anomalies, network-based stuff. For example, uh, they use flow-based data to detect anomalies. And you found less information about how to mitigate and respond to these attacks. So I think this is a quite missing topic uh, or not well done topic right now and I want to focus on this. And what is more interesting for you I think is what happened if 400 gigabits per second are going to reach your network. So I think this is one thing it's most important for you instead of having research publications. So um, my approach is I would like to optimize mitigation and response and I would therefore like to reduce the potential damages which are caused by these attacks and um, to reduce the attack effects. Okay, let's have a short look into my, short, uh, my first initial idea. So this framework I would like to build during my PhD thesis um, is located in high-speed networks and is based on flow-based data such as IPFIX and NetFlow and focuses on collaboration and basically uses exchange information. So we will have a short look into the components of this framework. High-speed network, what does it mean? I would like to use networks from uh, internet service providers um, because the data, the flow-based data is already there. They have the technical ability, they have the knowledge, they have a broader view what's going on in their network as end users and they might offer this service as a um, customer service. The next thing is I would like to use flow-based data in my framework because it is less data to analyze. As we have heard from Luke, I think he told us it is privacy preserving and kind of, but I think this is not fitting here. So, and they have the technical <laughs> ability again because I performed a survey and I found out that they have the technical ability to collect and process this data at their edge routers. Okay, finally, I would like to have a collaboration component inside um, because it enhances the view. So if you collaborate with other people, you could have a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach and you might be able to identify false positives, which you won't be able to identify if you are working on your own. So. Now I have this short card and um, I build it because I would like to ask you to help me to fine tune my research because I, I would love to have something that is for practical relevance and you would like to use and therefore I would really like to have you answer my questions in this small little survey and yeah, that's all I have to say. I would like to have a discussion with my poster and Maybe if you're interested, just pass by and get some of these nice little cards. The suspense, will they finish on time? Yeah, we're actually, we're actually going to get there, I believe. It's quite possibly. We now have Neil. Apparently the name is actually spelled... Neil. Yeah. Neil. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> does, the, does the clicker work? Are you trying? Have to the clicker no longer works. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. I can I can the press the button. We've got another one. The clicker now works. Yes. Oh, the clicker now works. Oh, it, thank you. There you go. Eating, eating away my time. Okay, about a year ready ago. Ready for it? I'm ready. There you go. I, I I see that we're doing this according to the proper protocol. Of the course. visitors go first, and the local the, the the sort of man of the house goes last. I work here in Belfield. I used to be an engineering student who sat in the first row of this. I've never spoken in this theatre before. Anyway, about a year ago, Brian Nisbet of HGANet told me that they were going to insist on having IPv6 in place for this conference. <coughs> so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to waste time on that slide. Previously, we had done a little bit of IPv6. We got a couple of public name servers going. We had no end users except me and one of the colleagues. And we had a tunnel doubling to HGANet from the special project routers. 
and it wasn't integrated with the production network. So what uh, Brian wanted for a TNC was that there'd be IPv6 for the end user, that it'd be provided on two, uh, two SIDs, uh, there'd be some limited amount of cabled IPv6, and the, native, uh, the uplinks should be moved from the tunnels to a native connection. And uh, what we wanted to get out of it was a little different. We wanted to position our organization so that we'd be ready for further IPv6 deployment by moving knowledge from one or two gurus into the network operations team. And we also wanted to assess the prospects for further IPv6 deployment. And operationally, we had a shopping list of things that we wanted to do. And we managed to achieve about half of those in the sense that it just worked. And we ran into problems with the others. For example, with anti-spoof filtering, we discovered the access route we were using didn't do reverse path forwarding verification. So we had to work around that by using access control lists that were tailored for each interface, for each prefix, and it was a bit painful. Uh, we weren't able to, by to replace the bypass routers with dual stack routers because some of the key parts of our network couldn't be upgraded because it was, ex it was going to be exam time. We were working from uh, middle of February to the end of March and the, the exams come up in April and there weren't allowed to be any disturbances in the force. So we ended up keeping a couple of bypass routers but otherwise going dual stack. We had some weirdness that was subverting uh, stateless auto configuration because RAs weren't getting back to the soliciting clients. We don't know why, we replaced the equipment where that was going with more modern equipment and more recent versions of the uh, iOS image. We're a Cisco shop and uh, the problem went away. We didn't waste any time trying to find out what, what, what the underlying cause was. We just wanted a remedy because Brian was breathing down our neck wanting to have this show on the road in time. And the biggest irritant was that we didn't get good address binding information between layer two and layer three. Despite having put a rule in the, in the, in the access control list that we were using for the anti-spoofing stuff, uh, we weren't getting all the neighbor advertisements that we thought we should have been getting. And so we weren't getting complete, uh, we weren't getting complete address binding stuff. And uh, that, uh, we found some workaround for the wireless side of things. Uh, nice gentleman, I think it was Scott who was speaking here earlier, uh, told us that uh, he'd found a solution for this in Loughborough. So we tried to do that. We got a whole load of extraneous log messages as well, but I think we got all the binding stuff we needed. And those were the kind of problems we had. And I thought it would be useful to uh, let people know, or at least it would be useful to exploit you guys just so I could have a rant. <laughs> Uh, but also, it might be useful to let you know that if you haven't gone six already, expect some, expect some bumps and potholes on the road. It's not plain sailing, and everything you've learned about running networks with V4 won't necessarily translate. And so, what we think is that the, the support for IPv6 hasn't really yet evolved to a state where it's truly manageable. Uh, because the features depend on the software image you can run, the software image depends on which box you actually have available, and so you can't necessarily meet your manage management requirements. And in our case, if we want to deploy six across the rest of the campus, other than in this building and in the O'Reilly Hall and on the, on the wireless, we're going to need to spend a lot of money. And what I think we're going to do is we'll probably keep IPv6 for Eduroam. We'll probably keep IPv6 in our server farm. And we'll defer further, further IPv6 deployment until it seems to be manageable. So, Gurumahige, thank you for listening. This is good. We now have an entire hour before the opening reception, so Guido will going to give us a, a best of. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Interpretive dance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But for some reason, we have a lot of time, and there's nothing to keep you entertained for the next hour, presumably other than walking very, very slowly. Um, uh, You're easily entertained. <laughs> oh, yes. You can go around the lake a few times. <laughs> Remember your badges. Fill in your feedback forms. Visit the student poster presentations. Um, and thank